Good morning, colleagues. And thank you so much for turning up this morning. And thank you for your usual patience. Um, this morning, our first presenter is Deputy Prime Minister, Honorable Dr. Ernest Hille, who is also Minister for Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture, and Information. Honorable. Thank you very much, Madam Press Secretary. Um, well, today, I think we'll deal with two basic issues. One, the tourism arrival numbers for July, and very shortly, you will get the monthly report um, as prepared by the Tourism Authority that provides all the details of the tourism numbers um, for the month of July. I think what is most exciting for us is the increase July on July. We witnessed an over 30% increase on July last year. Um, and of course, the second issue would have been the Walk for Progress yesterday. I'm sure I did, can't recall seeing any of you there, but um, we can take any questions you may wish to ask in that regard. So we will focus on those two issues. Uh, let me start off with the first one in terms of the tourism arrival numbers. <clears throat> I'm sure you would be aware that the carnival celebrations in July, which was the highlight of the month of July um, in itself, was a huge success. And it was very evident from the number, from the numbers of the persons who saw in the respective bands, as well as the support given to various um, events, you know, boat rides, parties, and the shows that we did in fact have a, a successful carnival. The parade itself was a magnificent one seen by some of the visuals that came out of the parade. And the data itself testifies to that success. And like I said, um, over 30% increase um, July on July. And last year was quite a successful month for us. Um, July this year was on par with 2019. Um, which was the biggest year that we've had in terms of tourism arrivals for, for the year. Um, we're still slightly down on yacht arrivals and cruise arrivals, uh, but we expect in the next cruise season for us to return to the 2019 figures. And of course, we've already started planning for, for next year. Um, we're very advanced in our planning for, for jazz next year, which is May. And of course, for um, carnival next year, we've started um, our planning Two weeks ago, we had our prize giving ceremony recognizing all the winners for this year's um, carnival celebrations. Um, I think the, the important thing for us is to continue to focus on the growth of the festival. Um, there are some very critical aspects of it. How do we ensure we maintain some historical significance to the celebration? How do we continue to manage its growth? Um, so we, we are prepared and we will be having a press launch you know, in early October and the international launch in Miami as usual just before Miami Carnival. So we're going to continue to, to work out. We're hoping to introduce a couple of new um, events for next year's Carnival and of course more details will be given out um, later on as we finalize and we lays with our stakeholders, but we will continue to grow the festival and continue to make it um, a success. Of course, even beyond Carnival, let me just mention this Friday, we celebrate La Rose, La um, St. Rose de Lima, the flower festival will be celebrated. And we're expecting this year's La Rose festival to be um, the grandest that we've had. Um, it's going to, of course, have the traditional church service um, on Friday morning. We will have the coronation of at least one new La Rose Queen um, at the church service. And afterwards, we'll have the parade around the city where the public will get a chance to see La Rose in its full um, you know, splendor. And of course, with the, the presentations on the um, Constitution Park as we've done in the past. But this year, La Rose will be special, um, having to witness the coronation of the Inu La Rose Queen. So I would want to invite all St. Lucians to look out for the La Rose um, celebration this year. Okay, even though the yacht arrivals, like you said, it's still not where we mm. want it to be. Um, <coughs> do you know or have any understanding of what, what is happening in the yacht industry as to why we're not seeing um, the numbers? Because the yacht in industry was big here, this mm. sector. Um, so what's happening? Because we know in the past couple of years, there were a lot of reports of um, 
robberies um, taking place and whatnot. Um, what has the government done? What is the Ministry of Tourism sorry, doing to... Hmm. Well, I, I think all the numbers down from 2019, not just yachting, but the stay-over arrivals have really rebounded this year. We're now surpassing 2019. Uh, the, the yachting is steadily you know, increasing. Um, two years ago, we had some of those problems. Last year, we worked hard on correcting some of those problems. And you would not have had reports in the last season. You'd have heard that the season before. Um, and it's a question of continuing to work and to promote and to make sure that St. Lucia is um, at the forefront, you know, of the minds of, of of persons in the yachting sector. So, so we're going to continue to work um, to make sure that we, you know, deal with all the issues. Um, but it, we expect it to reach um, its peak very shortly. And there is no one particular item one can see that is the cause why we've not look look at even the regional arrivals. We're still below where we were in 2019. And when you see the figures, you realize um, we still have some issues with regional arrivals. Um, of course, we do know that FL lift is still an issue. Um, one of the reasons why we were able to have such a good July is because of the increase in seats this summer, both from jazz all the way up to um, end of August. We, we've had a significant increase in the number of seats, uh, and that has helped us. So um, we're going to continue the efforts to promote yachting and to, to try to attract a lot more yachts than we have. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we actually um, finalizing plans to submit to DCA in relation to Marigo Bay. There's going to be a complete redevelopment of Marigo Bay. It's going to cost a lot of money, but we're finalizing the plans for it. Thank you, Mr. On, on the question of, just along those lines, before it probably switch subject, um, on the question of yachting, I think one of the issues, and you may correct me on this, would be sort of the services provided within the yachting sector. I don't know for years we've been trying to increase the skill level that's been offered, uh, whether it be um, for the, 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 the for the mechanics, uh, for, for the yachts, the uh, sail repairs and things of that sort. Is that an area perhaps that we can look into to bolster um, the arrival so that when people when they come in they know that they can find those sort of services mm -hmm. here well I, I think that the marina and certainly the capacity of the marina is is quite you know established and, and they can deal with a lot of those issues and we're also in discussion with an investor to build another boat yard in St. Lucia um, so there, there, there are um, some of the some developments that you know will address the issue of capacity to meet some of the technical needs of, of, of yachties. Um, but I, I mean, I'm satisfied. I've not heard any complaints that say the marina cannot meet the needs of, of anybody right now. Mm. Where is the Sorry? It's actually next to the marine base, but um, we are in discussions now, Slasper, Invest, and the investor about the establishing a boat yard. Okay. Yeah, marine police, yeah. Okay, um, so I'm um, speaking of your newest um, ambition to our festivities, the Yamaha um, believe it's the summer fest. Could you please mm -hmm. give me the latest on it? Because I've been speaking to some French people and they look forward to it. So you could please give us the latest on what's happening on the promotions, etc., happening within Guadeloupe and uh, Martinique. Because yeah. as I said, I was up there and I spoke to a few of you here at and they are speaking about it already, so can mm. you just give us a little Well, I mean, we did have the official launch of the Yamaha um, Sunfest and, um, about three weeks ago. Um, we had the official launch, and very shortly we will um, announce the headliner who will headline um, the festivity. So, but all the preparations are going on quite promotions. nicely. The promotions, yeah, the promotions are going on quite well. Very, again, um, in the next few days, we will officially start the sale of tickets. I think it's the last day of August, the sale of tickets will commence. And in the first week of September, the headliner will be announced. Um, I think the headliner has some contractual arrangements for an appearance, so he will not be announced until that appearance. But it's going to be a, a really attractive headliner. And of course, as we approach um, early November, all the promotions will step up. But it's going to be a major event, major, major event. And it's going to become a regular feature on our calendar of events. My final question would be on our culture, our Lawis on Friday, sir. Mm. And uh, I mean, 
mean, I'm a Laros person, telling us yes, it's rightful. And you keep on hearing the same thing, it's not enough money is being pumped into Laos. You'd hear a little band say not enough. You'd hear people say the same way the carnival bands have the costumes. We are carnival too. We have the costumes and enough is not being given to us in the sense of the way we do our business. We have costumes to make every year, etc. Will the government almost the same way that you all are pumping it into the carnival? Because our Laros could be just as big as our carnival the intentions to maybe pump and maybe make it maybe our second carnival because it's the only festival of a kind within the Caribbean. I mean, it's only Guyana who has something close and it basically follow what we have. Well, I mean, the, the government does not give the carnival bands money to, to build costumes. I mean, people pay for their costumes. Um, well, concessions is, is all, that, that, that's not a problem to get concessions. But we have put more money into La Rosa and La Magritte, more than ever. I mean, until this government, um, they, it has really, I think, $50,000 has been given every year. Um, we've significantly increased that, and there's more support. I'm not saying there's enough support, but there's more support being given. And I, I think the important, the strategic import, um, objective for the next couple of years is to build a number of groups, make the groups that exist stronger, and start building new groups. So I think this year you will see one new La Rose group. I think the Monrepo group, not Monrepo, Deriso will have a group um, for the first time. Um, and, and it is to, to ensure we have more groups. La Magritte a little different. La Magritte falls during the school terms and all the schools are involved and there's a lot more activity that takes place um, but we're going to continue to increase support and to make it bigger um, but because of its nature it's a little difficult comparing it to carnival because carnival people would pay two thousand dollars for a costume and to come out on the road La Margaret is slightly what different well, well, I think it's more than marketing. Um, the, the persons who are involved in La Rose are not exactly individuals who would spend two thousand five hundred dollars on a on a costume. I mean, uh, yeah, and I don't know that government can pay for costumes for each person. Um, so it's a different dynamic, and we need to discuss how we can give them the concession, how we can give them the support um, for them. And not just and not just the costumes, musicians. They need the musicians to be going around with them playing the music and, and, and celebrating so but we, we're going to continue to dialogue and to see how best we can provide more support for the flower festival to grow and, and like you i think a dream of all of us is that the flower festivals because of its uniqueness um, will become a major um, you know, attraction and festival in St. Lucia. It is significant already, but in terms of promoting it um, to, to really stand out as, a, as an attraction, um, we'll continue to work on that. And yes, we, we note, we, the report shows that we, know we, have, we have the American Airlines JetBlue mm. helping to increase the flights, yeah, the international yeah. flights. But in terms of the, the regional, we know we've heard of inter-American Inter-American mm. Airways mm. and Liat lately there was some talk of the of yeah, twenty twenty. What mm. what is the regional early flag? Is there any prospects for you know I mean reduced airfares? Is it something that the tourism ministers are, are looking into? Yeah, well, uh, the we're still hoping that the year twenty twenty can come on full steam and add to the number of seats. Um, we continue to struggle as a region. Um, Inter Caribbean has been doing a fantastic job, but still have challenges. It is challenging to have, you know, a regional service, which is why we need to have both a public sector and public private sector solution to make sure that you know we, we, we cover. Um, all options available. So we're looking forward to Liat. You will notice in the estimates for this financial year, the Prime Minister allocated about $1 million under our ministry to support any regional initiative we believe can help um, promote you know, inter-Caribbean, um, inter-regional travel. So we have a vested interest in it and a deep interest in making sure that it, it, it works out. Um, you know, every time I see the monthly reports come on uh, arrivals, I look to see the Caribbean numbers because I, I really want the Caribbean numbers to, to, to continue to grow and to go even faster. But of course, we're limited by, um, you know, the airlift capacity. But you raise an important point um, in terms of the cost of, of travel. And a few days ago, I had a discussion and it is something that will come up at the next, um, you know, Ministers of Tourism meeting, especially OECS, which we may have early next week. 
is what can we do to reduce the cost of travel? Uh, and one idea is, of course, to reduce the taxes, because the taxes are quite um, you know, high. Whether or not we can look at the numbers uh, and to do some modeling and to see whether we can reduce um, the level of the taxes and make a proposal to the ministers of finance to reduce the level of taxes in the hope that we'll have more tra persons traveling. And at what point does it become beneficial to reduce at to what level to allow more people to travel? How price sensitive it is, in, a, in, in other words. Um, I'm for one who supports you know, the removal of taxes on interregional travel, but it's not as easy as that. But the, the fact is the numbers are not growing fast enough, but partly because of not just the cost, but also to just the availability of seats. So we'll continue to work on that. Okay, and just to, just to back up, I, I might not be um, Okura, you know, Elif and Fez, but mm. would it, in the terms of a marketing strategy, I mean, with Caribbean, is Philly festivals. Mm. We have carnival, we have jazz, mm. now we have cricket. Mm. Is there not a package deal for the Caribbean um, um, travelers, you know, like a discount deal at Christmas or every Christmas or carnival or jazz or whatever, and also, the, the, um, the, the ferry service yeah, yeah, was, was yeah. something that has been touted. Would that not be another option in, in terms of you know making travel more affordable yeah. for the region? Well, let's look at the ferry in the first instance. Um, there, there's been a lot of talk about the ferry, a lot of uh, suggestions of adding ferries south of St. Lucia. We all know the challenge of going to Barbados on ferry unless you have a ferry that is big enough that it can deal with the Atlantic Ocean. Um, a lot of people don't want to travel by sea. That is reality because of motion sickness and whatnot. Um, so in itself, you know, it, people have challenges. If you're going to go to Grenada, the idea of having to go on a ferry for seven hours as against if you fly for 45 minutes is a big difference. Uh, and people, some people tell you they rather just fly and, and pay the extra than go on a ferry. But the ferry has worked well, certainly if Martinique. Dominica and Guadeloupe, in the case of St. Lucia, especially Martinique and, and Guadeloupe. So a culture has developed of using the ferry between those islands. And because of the nature of, of the travel, business people don't really take the ferry. But if you go on a line, you go into a Denric, um, Dominica Creole Festival, you, you go and shop in Martinique, you won't see your family, even medical treatment persons will, will take the ferry. So it, it has worked well. It has not really proven to be equally attractive to go south of St. Lucia. But there is talk. And, and possibilities being explored right now. Um, you mentioned about package tours, but again, just look at the breakdown of the f cost structure. If government taxes is more than half of the cost, you as a private person or even an airline, how much of a package can you really give in terms of discounted when the, the greater part of the fare is not even your, your fare? As the airline, it is government taxes. Because remember, when you look at the breakdown there, if you're going to fly to Grenada and you, you go through St. Vincent, like St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Grenada, you pay taxes in St. Lucia, you pay taxes in St. Vincent, and you pay taxes in Grenada. So you pay three sets of government taxes just to go to Grenada. Just to go to Grenada. Now, the airline portion of it is, is not you know, as significant as the taxes. So if you're going to start talking about packages, the airlines virtually have to give you the seat and just say you just pay government taxes, which will not make sense. Um, you know. So we have to have a discussion about government taxes. Now, the governments have taxes in place because that's the revenue stream for them to pay for the new airport terminals, upgrades, and the new airports. So what government does is take a loan and say to the, the, the lender, the revenue from ticket taxes is what's going to pay back the loan. So if you tell them I'm going to take it away from you, they're not going to ask you. How am I going to pay the loan for my airport upgrade? Now, then we have to be able to put forth an, an argument that says, if people are coming to your country, because it's now cheaper, they spend more in your country, your VAT returns increase, your government revenue increase, and therefore there is another benefit that can help pay the loan, you know, because there's greater economic activity arising from the visitation of, of those persons. Um, so we need to look at it and to, to, to analyze the different aspects. But one thing I'm sure of is because of those high taxes, um, it is a detriment to travel. It, it's just like, too expensive for some people to travel. Even those who are thinking about it, just the cost of it. So how can we cause travel to take place for us is, is a critical issue.
development? How many, apart from ten? I, I wouldn't. I, I'll have to find that out and give you accurate information. Okay. Um, the prime minister yesterday announced that um, uh, that soon you make announcement on the airport and how yeah. you're going to, um, I guess, even finance that. So does that mean we're no longer looking at a loan? I, he said he will make announcements, okay. and he said he's coming, so let him come <laughs> with all the information. <laughs> Just, I, I guess, in, in terms of St. Lucia's part, what is it that we could possibly offer in terms of, of cutting or reducing taxes? No, I, I think I want to participate in a discussion, um, and certainly will raise it with my colleagues, um, about how we can approach ministers of finance to reduce the taxes. Uh, we have to find a way to reduce the taxes, even if it has to be... Um, a circle of those who are willing and able to do it. It doesn't have to be all the countries to agree. But if two three countries can agree, we can start the process of reducing the cost of travel. And I think we really need to work on this. It should not be too expensive for the average solution to want to go to Barbados, to pay $2,000 to, to travel and whatnot. The, the activity, the events activity in the country is increasing. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, pretty soon you are yeah, I mean, to go to St. Vincent, which is 10, 12 minutes away, to pay so much money. We, we need to do something about it. Maybe I'll ask you some of the hardest questions here. He's in my colleagues, former colleagues. Um, Two-part two question. Um, we all know when the slow season for the cruise ship is, hurricane season. Mm -hmm. But perennially, you find market vendors, dry craft, craft vendors in particular, lamenting, bemoaning the lack of economic activity mm -hmm. as a result of this dry season. The latest plea is, well, perhaps the government can consider uh, maybe maybe cutting the rent costs or, you know, meeting them halfway during those perennial dry or slow seasons. That's question one. Question two is, this is going back to Carnival, um, Community Carnival specifically, it's another niggling issue. It happens every so often every year where you find Community Carnivals spill over into August and maybe other... Uh, other activities are maybe even overshadowed or it, it causes conflict with yeah, other yeah. national activities in that month. Yeah. Uh, what can you do? Have you done? Are you doing to sort of find some sort of balance to, yeah. to keep kind of a caged in July and before to allow August to breathe with these other activities? Those are the two questions. Yeah. Well, um, let's start with the second one. Um, when, we started, when I started off as minister, uh, my whole intention, and I explained was for us to have all community carnivals before the national parade, the national um, carnival. And we really push for it. And even say, suggesting that subventions will only be given to carnivals before the national, as a way of you know, um, forcing the issue. Um, some of the communities um, came back and, and argued that their carnivals had historical significance. And those things had been going on for decades in some cases, almost 20 years of having the carnival the first weekend in August, and to almost force it before the national for them was a little difficult. And we really tried to persuade them. We use a lot of moral suasion. We've not really enforced um, the threat that you know we'll only give subvention to those who are before the national. Because we are acutely aware that August is Emancipation Month, and we want that reserved for that purpose. Um, so, but some communities have said, no, 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 we've been doing this on this date for how many years and we still want to continue to do it. We're going to continue the moral suasion to speak with them, to encourage them. Because having the community carnivals before the national also helps build up, um, you know, the, the, the vibe, build up the, you know, the whole momentum towards the national. And we really want all of them to, to be able to do so. Um, so from the weekend after jazz ends to start community um, carnival. So it, it has not exactly worked out that way. We will continue to speak with them about it and to push them to have it before um, the, the, the national. So that, that for us is critical. And also too, in terms of standards and, and, and whole procedures and how they manage it, how they organize it, it would be a lot easier for us to be able to set those standards and to police it and manage it if it's within a season. But once it starts going over the season, by which time everybody is already switching off to another activity, it makes it a little difficult. And you find community carnivals, there are trucks and there are no, um, how do you call them? Bad, bad, bad. 
the barriers and all those things and we saw some of what that can cause what not so we still want to set those standards and the whole management of, of the community carnivals to a certain stand, standard um, so yeah the, the the first point you made about the vendors is, is critical and, and and I think we need to think of alternative ways of getting the vendors um, to participate in the process so the first thing we have to do is to get more cruise ships in the off season now that's proving to be more and more difficult because a lot of the cruise ships are phasing out the smaller ships and going with larger ships. So you notice the ships are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know some of the smaller ships, which they probably could use during the off season when the demand is lower, because they won't bring the large ships during the off season when demand is low, they send them to other parts of the world. So they're now saying to us, those smaller ships, we can have the high polluting ships, we need to get them out. The new standards in the industry requires, you know, a certain amount of emission and, and you know, um, carbon footprints and whatnot. So uh, it becomes challenging. So it makes you wonder, what next do we do? And, and one of the ideas that has run through my head is to charge the vendors only according to when they are cruise ships in the harbor. You know, maybe a formula like this. So if you're not making money on the day, I will not charge you. But the days when you are making money, I will charge you. That's, you're talking about six months? Well, I'll, I, no, I will charge you per day. So if there's no, there's no cruise ships, I don't charge you. But every day there's a cruise ship. If I charge you $20, I can in the first, that six months, make the money for the whole year. Yeah, so when your cash flow is high and you can afford to pay me, you pay me. When you have no cash flow, you don't pay me. You understand what I'm saying? I suspect the Vendors Association will be very intrigued by that proposal. I mean, it's just something that's been floating in my head. Uh, but if, if you think about it, it, it's fairer for both sides. I still make my annual earnings from renting to you. And it also helps you because when you are cash flow and better able to pay, you can pay. And when you cannot pay, you don't pay. You know? But it's something we're going to talk about and I, I'm, I'm going to float with, with, with them. No, no, that's the point I was making. Some communities, Grozile is one of them, um, that always have theirs the first weekend um, in August. So can we move on to, you still want more questions still? And uh, can back to the business. Um, the vendors have been crying about um, basically the, I believe I've spoken to you about that and trying to get more tools because you have four or 5,000 people coming to Central. The but you've asked me that question already. I've answered yeah. that already. You know. Yes, but still they keep on asking. No, me. but 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 the answer is clear. We when we redo the, the the port, when we redo the port, the way the new vendors arcade will be designed with the new development by GPH, it will allow for every cruise passenger to access the vendors arcade. Now the most we can do is to bring the vendors to you, bring the pass the, the cruise passengers to you. I can't force them to buy. But I will tell you, we will redesign it in a way where everybody that comes off a cruise ship will go through the vendor's arcade. So you, ha you will have access to, to, to the cruise passengers. But the other thing we have to do, and the vendors must come to terms with, they must stop thinking of themselves as vendors. And they're gone already. Nobody has an obligation and there's no entitlement to buy from you. You're a salesperson. So, so you have to change your whole mindset and your whole approach to it. And I've said to them, I said, look, I've gone, I've traveled outside St. Lucia and I've bought items, not because I really wanted the item, but I was so impressed with the, the vendor, you know, the way they approach it, the way they try to get me to buy it. I just buy it because they, they have a story and narrative about almost every item, you know, that they are selling and, and, and they almost carry you along that journey until you just buy it. You must see yourself as a salesperson. Nobody has to come to you and must buy from you just because you're a vendor. Convince them, charm them, entice them, and make them buy from you. And then when they tell you they only have a card, don't tell them you don't have a machine because it's only cash you're taking. Because some people don't carry cash. So, you know, the, the whole modernization of, of, of that, that, that sector has to take place. And my ministry is going to address it. We, we're fully aware of it, so we're talking about some of the, the, the improvements we can make in that regard. The presentation, like in fruits, I was in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. You see the selling fruits on the street. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what it is that they're selling. Mm -hmm. But the way you want to, you want to buy it, yeah. now we're selling we have the purple, we have the pineapple, mm. we have t-shirts, I mean, 
Yeah, there, there's a lot that has to be done. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's move on to the match. Yes, I was about to ask. Minister, yeah, sorry. yeah. The walk. So, sorry. Yeah. So the I know that when you are in the moment, it can yeah. be grand, but mm. the morning after, when as you reflect, mm. how do you feel about the the walk for progress? Well, I think um, if you saw the, the post on my page yesterday, it, it probably spoke to that feeling that um, it was not about numbers. It was really an opportunity to say thank you to St. Lucians, as well as for St. Lucians to express confidence and, and, and support for um, the work that has been done. Um, and I'm not going to spread blame on either side, whatnot. The fact is, in this country right now, the political atmosphere is too toxic. It's just too toxic. It's, it's not healthy. And like I'm saying, I'm not saying right or wrong. It's just not healthy. And we almost have to reduce, reduce, reduce it, reduce it. It's become very personalized. It's become very, you know, um, you know, in a sense, um, I try and find the right word to use. It's, it's become almost vicious, and there's a viciousness in it. And we just need to tone down, tone down. And if you listen to narratives, you would believe that the country is in total despair and disarray, and the country is just been um, is sinking into the deepest hole you can find. And yesterday was a statement that that's not true, um, that there are people, a significant number of people in this country that, you know, aware of the work that's been done and the, the, the progress that is being made. And they, come out, they came out yesterday, despite the inclemency of the weather, despite all the, 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 you know, the uncertainties, they came out and, and they, they walked. And, and I can tell you, I was saying to somebody, um, we still have a couple more gears we could have gone up in terms of bringing out more people. So um, yesterday was really about that. And, and this morning was just a recommitment to work hard and to deliver. In my, for my part, I know the, the, the better part of the work that we have to do is just about to start you know, in tourism, in terms of improving the infrastructure in the country. In my constituency, I've not even started my constituency projects yet. Well, uh, probably two of them have started, the Monley by and the Cicero Playing Field. Well, we're about to complete the Bassett Joseph Community Center, but I still have a lot more that I, I want to do over the next two years. So when I heard the Prime Minister said he was about to call the Governor General, I was like, you know, the boss, take it easy, take it easy. You know, I, you know, I, I still want to do some more. So. For us, it was a reaffirmation that we are working and we're not perfect. We will never boast of being perfect. We make mistakes and sometimes we fall short and we reflect and we recalibrate and we come again. Um, and that's the nature of the beast. And to try and stay humble through it all. It's time to calm, compose and stay focused. So for me this morning when I woke up, it was with renewed energy. Um, to just continue to persevere and to do the work that has to be done. So do you think it's a gauge for for your election, perhaps whenever the Prime Minister decides to go ahead and, and, and ring the bell? Well, I, I don't think it's so much a gauge for elections. I don't think we even think in elections. It was more a gauge to just reaffirm to us that, yes, we are working and people are supportive and for us to say thank you to them. Um, the time will come when we'll think of elections. As it turns out in the political cycle, the opposition always thinks about elections. The opposition always wants elections. Um, until you call it and then they, they, they start you know, wondering whether they did the right thing. But we're not thinking about that. Um, yesterday was a statement to us of where we're going at this point in time and, and the level of support we have for what we are doing. And to really renew our focus, like the PM said, keeping our eyes on the prize. Because we have a, we have a, a vision of where we want to go. I was thinking about the, the, the sort of uh, um, rhetoric that's on, on the ground, and you talk about, you know, you want it to, mm. to cool off a bit. There's too much viciousness mm. going on. But even last evening on, on platform, and even now, uh, Minister, uh, you have failed. When I say you, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, all and sundry on, on the government side you still failed to be specific in your calling mm. for that. Mm. Can you be more specific? Can you call on your supporters mm. to desist from uh, the name calling, the disparaging remarks online, mm -hmm. uh, the 
now is your opportunity to mm. really speak mm. to your base. Right. And to, because if you're saying that there's just too much of mm. this negativity going on, mm. um, can you now use this opportunity to call on them to, to stop it? And perhaps any, any disparaging comments and posts that are online about even the police commissioner or the mm. police officers. We have Dr. Mel Clark. There mm. are, um, we have Dr. Alison Jean. There's so many going on. Now is the opportunity. Yeah, sir. no, I, I think the Prime Minister did that last night. Like you said, he wasn't specific. But last night he did say that, and he said it to all of us. Let's not go down certain roads. We're not doing this. But he's saying it to you. No, you, you also said it last night. No, you said it last night that he does to not. The yes, he, he said so. so. He base. said so last yeah. night to the base. Yeah. I do not want. Uh, and I'm saying to you all, don't do this. Of course, you know, you can't control all surrogates. You can never support, um, control all surrogates. And some persons, it's like a ceasefire. You know, I, I back off, but if you take me on, uh, I'll, I'll answer you and I'll take you back on. And, and it, it continues. And, and I will say it, I have no difficulty in saying it. And you know what really touches me, and I'm very, very passionate about that. You see me, I'm in the political sphere. You'll come after me, I decide when I'm going to answer you, and I decide how much blows I take, because I know I can take care of myself, and I know I can fight. But there are a lot of public servants, there are a lot of families, there are a lot of you know, children and whatnot that should not be brought into that warfare, should not, that political warfare, should not be brought in. And, and for me, for a fact, you, you draw certain lines, you know, we go at each other, we blast each other, we beat up each other. Every now and then we step over the line and you pull back because that's the nature of the dynamism of political um, contests. But there's certain things you just don't do and you try not to do it. I mean, trust me, even for my own part, there are times I believe I could take certain people to court and sue them and then on reflection you realize, nah, you're not doing that. Just leave it alone and just move on. Not that you can't do it. You're fully entitled and you know you can do it. But you just decide, you know what, just leave that alone and just move on. Take the blows and just move on. And sometimes in politics you have to do that. And we draw the line sometimes and we're just not going to cross it. Sometimes your surrogates don't listen to you. Sometimes they feel more hurt than you, the person who's been um, harmed by it. Um, but we need to say it, and I will say it. I will say it. The Prime Minister said it last night, and I will say it again. We need to just tone down the political rhetoric and the toxic nature of our society right now, the divisiveness, the division. All of us need to tone it down. And all of us must respect each other. Let's, let's debate. Let's argue. Let's debate, let's argue, but let's just tone it down. Let's just tone it down. But nobody must ever believe, nobody must ever believe that one side can throw it at will and the right and fully entitled to do it and the other side cannot or should not respond. Nobody should ever fool themselves because trust me, I mean, f battles can be fought, but let's not fight those battles. Let's not fight them and let us put St. Lucia in a sense, in a place where we don't try to destroy St. Lucia. We don't try to, 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 you see what we have that is treasured, our country? Let, let us try and keep it sacred. But let us debate, let's argue. I love a good debate, I love a good argument. And I don't have to get personal with you to debate. I can just argue with you on the basis of facts and on the basis of argument. But most times when people get personal like that, it's because they're so weak in their facts and in their arguments. They cannot stand up to you. So they go below the belt and they try and get nasty and they try to destroy your reputation. They try and make false accusations. Anytime you see people doing that, you know it's a weakness on their part. But as minister with responsibility for the CIP, will you or have you been satisfied with the performance of Miss um, Pierre at the unit? Miss Pierre? Who is Miss Pierre? Miss Felicia Pierre. Come on, Lisa. Obviously, everything I'm saying is lost on you. No, Minister. You but let's talk about the walk. Let's talk about the walk. No, we, we the, 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 walk, the walk yesterday showed that people are very satisfied with the performance of the government. Hold on. Hold on. Very satisfied with the performance of the government. They showed that they still support the government and that they want us to continue along the path. And after yesterday, all the negativity, all the maypui, all the malpines, all those things goes out of the window. Well, you just said we, to me a while ago, that just moments ago, mm. that you debate on the facts. Yeah. I'm just asking you if you have been satisfied with her performance okay. at the unit. That's let, what let, I'm me, let me answer it. Let me answer you dif differently. Let me answer you differently. And I assume that you're sensible enough 
you're astute enough, you're knowledgeable enough. Do you really believe that me as minister would know of the performance of every staff member in every agency that falls under my portfolio? To even suggest you asking me that question reinforces the point that I'm making, that you have to be part of the solution. You cannot be part of the problem because you would have known. I, it's like asking me whether the driver in the ministry, I'm satisfied with him. Well, we how, how, that, as hold a, on, hold we on, please. The position is a little bit higher. No, no. That. Well, I don't even know. I don't even know. But you know better than that. You know better than that. So let's stay the course. You and I were having a discourse on how we can reduce the toxic nature of the discourse in our society right now. Let's talk more about how we can do that. Absolutely, Minister, and I agree. But let's go that. back to the match. Let's go back to the walk of progress. Two issues today. Can ever. Um, Tourism arrival numbers and the walk of progress. Were you happy with the walk of progress yesterday? I watched the walk. Did of you walk? Progress. No, unfortunately. You probably should have. The, You'd have made a powerful statement if you walked yesterday. No, don't worry. I'm all for progress. No, but well, you should have walked. I, I'm all for and progress. And the next time we walk, and I'll make sure you walk with me. That you did not take the opportunity to answer the question because well, I thought it would have diffused the situation. Well, because certainly for you know, because if I, I think you're a lot wiser than that. If, if Lisa, her record is being called into question, then at least you had the opportunity to diffuse. Lisa, if you're calling her record was, into question, Lisa, I am not doing that. Well, okay, thank you so much, Lisa. Lisa. I, I, I never did that. I was just. Giving you the opportunity to, to say that Lisa. she was well suited yeah, yes, for the position. That's all. Thank you very much, Lisa. Okay, sir. Mm. Uh, let me put uh, Just for one last one. Question, last one. Uh, Dominica recently welcomed their Olympian Botswana. Their first yeah. Olympian came home to a resounding, a, it's a resounding welcome. Solutions are it's building up expectations. Yeah. Yeah. I know you're involved in the planning as chair. Yeah. of the uh, committee, what can St. Lucia, can you give us a preview or a hint as to well, what's to come for uh, Julian when she gets here? Julian is getting here September 24th, and she'll be, huh? Breaking news. Did you know, know that? Uh, I spoke out of turn, man, yeah. But yeah, she's coming, she'll be here for about three or four days, so we will plan a very comprehensive program for her and, and make sure that she gets a welcome and a recognition befitting of an Olympic champion and the fastest woman in the world. And let's all be proud St. Lucians. Lisa, you too. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, thank you, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, San can share the, the data um, with you. Yeah. All right. Okay, colleagues, so our second speaker is Senator Honorable Dr. Pauline Antoine Prosper who is the Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Education, Sustainable Development, Innovation, Science, Technology, and Vocation Training. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Not yet. Yes. Um, on Thursday, the 22nd of August, the Ministry of Education met with the owners of private early childhood centers. The government had promised to give them a startup for the new school year of $2,500. And so we met them in Denry on Thursday at a ceremony where we handed to them their checks of $2,500. We know very well that post-COVID, many of those early child, or all of them, had difficulties because their clients lost their jobs, they had to pay rent, they had to pay staff, and it has been very difficult for, for them. I am aware that some of the parliamentary representatives had reached out to some of them. But the Prime Minister felt that we needed to bring relief to those early childhood centers. After all, we have made early childhood a priority. And those centers operated by themselves. The government often supported the government centers. So it is a one-shot payment of $2,500 and it was well received by the early childhood centers. Um, I have a question, but not on what you just said. 
I see, good. Okay, um, my question to you is, has the Department of Education responded to the letter that the students who were studying at Spartan University, the medical students, um, they called on the ministry to help them with their situation because the school had lost its accreditation. Um, also the fact that they actually lost out on the tuition that they had paid, they never got the, the requisite classes for it. And um, right now many are either at home, some are both, some have been able to matriculate in other universities, but there are many others who are hoping for help from the ministry to be placed at other universities so they could continue and most probably start off the whole medical studies again. We are aware of the situation. We have been in consultation with Spartan, and we are helping as far as we can. I'm not talking about Spartan, I'm talking about the students. They wrote the a letter to the Department mm -hmm. um, of Education, mm -hmm. the Minister. Um, also, the other, um, you, the other officials are also CC'd in that letter. Mm -hmm. Have you all responded, or do you all plan to respond to the students? We do plan to respond. We, we have not responded in full, but we are on top of the situation. You have not responded in full, so you have made contact with some of the students? Or? Well, not all of them, but we would have, um, at ministry level, we are, we are dealing with the situation. Because this is not a, a, a decision that is um, something that has financial implications, and the minister and the ministry on its own cannot, cannot take final decisions on matters of that, that nature. But with the university itself, what have they told you to reassure you that going forward they will be, I guess, ensuring that this doesn't happen again or they actually working towards accreditation? What have they said? Well, you know that we have an accreditation unit in place at the moment, and this is the responsibility of that unit. The accreditation unit doesn't fall under the Department of Education? Yes, it does. So you have no idea what is it that they will be doing? What I'm asking, because mm -hmm. the minister did meet with, so is it possible if we could get um, an well, idea we, how we, that meeting we went ensure, We ensure that every university that wants to operate on island is accredited, and we are ensuring that they meet the requirements of the committee. How are you ensuring that? Well, there is a there is a checklist. There there are things that, that there are requirements that they have to meet, and as long as they meet those requirements, this is only when that we, we are going to allow them to operate here. I am not saying things have not been done badly in the past, but we are here to correct the mistakes. Okay. Okay. Just, just quickly, um, you know, in terms of the, the school. Um, Curricula. We've heard a lot lately about TVET, you know, mm -hmm. the vocational part of the training institute, you know, of, among school. How how much is that been? How much is being done to really, you know, push through that 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 area of you know educational development in terms of kids, you know, learning skills and learning, you know, different, you know, methods to you know, to earn their livelihood. It has to be a holistic approach. The Ministry of Education has the department that takes care of ensuring that the schools are equipped, that there is enough, um, that the schools are advertised, they, they know what they're about. And in the media, I'm sure you have heard some of this. I am not saying that enough has been done, but the work is ongoing in promoting the TVET schools, um, we are aware that there may be stigma attached to some of the schools because of their performance, etc. But we are trying our best to ensure that the parents embrace, that they understand. Because we, we, some of us still feel that TVET is for children who are operating at the, 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 lowest, um, the lowest scale. However, the research has shown that this is not true, that the very best students can do as well in, in, in TVET. I remember going on a study tour in Guyana and the children who were getting 14 and 15 CXEs were doing TVET and they were doing extremely well in, in, in both fields. So we have to sell out that concept. We have to throw away that misconception that TVET is for children who are not academic and, and allow our children to benefit 
from, because I tell them every day that the money is, is with TVET. Those of us who teach, we don't make any money. Our students um, who go out and do um, electricals and other, you know, they are the ones who make the money out there. So this is what we have to sell to our public so that they embrace the concept of, of technical vocational education. Yeah, and just a good backup, we know that four, four schools, four institutions are yeah. identified. So with the new year coming mm -hmm. in, especially now we know science technology, like you said, outside the box, science technology, digital, you know. With the new year, with the new school term, what, is, what would be the, 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 the ratio, the average of kids wanting to enter into these um, four institutes? Mm -hmm. Is there a push to get, are they, how do they identify them? To, as, do they, as, do they make up, you know, do they mm, as anything, As and anything they, else, anytime you're starting um, anything, there is skepticism, People are not willing, and as I said before, it is something we have to sell. Um, the classes are not big at, at this time, but we are hopeful that as time goes on, that we are going to get many more students who are going to opt for, for te the technical vocational school. Um, we are making an attempt to show them what equipment, what is available at the schools, so that we have, we have more students who are opting for, for, for technical vocational education. It's not unusual for government to support to support parents and teachers for back to school. Mm -hmm. um, as parliamentary secretary, are there any noticeable changes, or how would you assess the level of support parents, teachers have received going for the back to school this this year, this time around? This year, first of all, the students who went into um, first year at secondary school got their five hundred dollar bursaries. The government has also invested up to $2 million to give back to school assistance to parents to help them buy school uniforms, school shoes, school book books, what have you, to the most vulnerable parents to assist them in ensuring that their children have a, a good start for the new academic year that starts on the 2nd of September this year. And um, I know also teachers do get some assistance? Yes, Was in, in, se in September, the teachers will get their TMA. Some of them were asking because they noticed it wasn't on the, on the salary for August, but we have re reassured them that they will get their TMA with their salary in September. And the new students for, who are going to form one at secondary school, all of them are going to get the new laptop when school reopens as well, when they go in for registration as well. Are uh, part-time teachers eligible for the TMA? Yes. Both, so both, both so yes. full-time and part-time? Yes, because we would give it in August, and the students, the teachers who are temporary, who say they didn't get. So when we give in September, everybody who is readmitted in September, they receive their TMA. I think that's the second time that's happened? Yes. Ever? That both sets? Both sets are getting, yes.